It's a pleasure uh, to bring to Nobles um, a uh, fellow who resides up in my hometown, at least currently he does. Are you, I don't know, are you originally from Baltimore? No, I'm from New Mexico, but oh, I okay. live there now. Okay. <laughs> so he, he's, Ho he's Hopkins uh, educated, go Blue Jays. And uh, we're really thrilled to have him here. He's a journalist, a writer, a futurist. And so I was thinking about, uh, as I read of the, uh, the early goings of his book, and I was thinking, wow, we do live in interesting times. And then I got thinking about uh, the future. You know, Thomas Wolfe said you can't go home. John Lennon said life is what happens while you're planning. Uh, and R.E.M., of course, sung it's the end of the world as we know it. And I thought that last one probably um, was most descriptive of some of the things that um, uh, Patrick is going to talk to us about today. He's interested and has a rather unique perspective on the future, especially as it relates to big data, prescriptive and uh, predictive analytics, uh, as well as our future as individuals and certainly as professionals in the science and technology community. Please allow me to welcome and uh, please welcome with me Patrick Tucker. Thank you. Okay. Let's put my camera on here. All right, we're going to start there. We're going to do a little chit chat and then we're going to do Q&A um, because I think people like Q&A. So uh, first, yeah, I'm Patrick Tucker. Um, and the way these things usually start, also thanks for getting the book and I uh, hope, <laughs> hope you all like it. Um, the way these usually start is the guy gets up and he's like, okay, everybody turn off your phone, everybody turn off your phone, whatever. I want everybody just really quickly do something a little bit unusual, take out your phone and turn it on. And as you do this, I want to see if you hear anything unusual, right? Mine's already on. So just pay attention and listen for a second. Nothing, right? What's going to happen is this. First, at some point in our little conversation here, somebody's phone is going to ring. That person has to answer it. We all have to yell hello, and then that person awkwardly gets up and then takes the call out in the hall. <laughs> the other thing that happens when you turn on your phone more immediately is your phone makes contact with the cell base station. We all know that, and that begins shading signals. What a lot of people don't know, um, as not only does your phone converse with one cell base station, it actually converses with a lot. And the number of cell base stations that your phone talks to continues to grow as we keep putting out more and more cell base stations. And what they do is they trade a bunch of signals and they're conversing about you and your future, about where you are right now and where you're going to go so that they can figure out which cell base station is the best one to provide your phone with service. So it's a huge conversation that is growing between a bunch of machines and your phone, and it's a conversation that you can't hear. So if your phone is like mine, it has GPS capability. I usually keep my GPS capability off. Um, who here has a phone with GPS? Who here has a smartphone? Raise your hand. Yeah, it's everybody. All right, so here's the thing. Um, it's weird to me. The official cell phone, smartphone penetration in the United States right now is about 70%. 70% of the American population is supposed to own a smartphone right now. Every time I give this talk, 100% of the audience owns a smartphone. Um, so I usually keep my GPS off. I'm going to turn it on. As I do this, um, pay attention and see if you hear anything unusual real quick. It's nothing, right? See, what's amazing to me is that as I do this, even here in this room, and I did check it before, but I guess you've got a room upstairs where it won't work, my phone begins to receive signals from space. It's the global positioning system. It's a network of satellites that we created uh, in order to originally find subs that were, we couldn't find anywhere else on Earth. Um, and now we all use it to get to places like in Virginia and whatnot. Um, so I think this is amazing, all right? We live in an age where everyone in any given room that you go into is going to be carrying around a phone that's having a conversation with a whole bunch of different machines and receiving signals from space and nobody thinks to ask what is that phone saying? We have a sense but we don't really know. So that is pretty much the definition of big data. Big data is not some obtuse thing. Big data is you. We our big data. We just created a whole bunch of it with email, video, and music streaming, tweeting, and all of the other digital interactions that we have, mostly streaming. We create 1.8 million megabytes of data each year. It's like nine CD-ROMs a day. Now, very little of it is actually stored permanently, and not all of it is useful. Like I said, a lot of it is just streaming data. 
All of it says something about you, what you're doing, where you're going, and why. You are big data. It is the reason we have 65 billion location tagged payments happening in the United States on an annual basis. It is 154 billion emails that are sent daily. Um, this figure here is out of date, but it still works. 90% of all of the data in the world was generated in just the last two years. It should be about 92 and it's the last three. But that still gives you a sense of what data is, how much of it we make, how much of it is relevant to you. Um, and it also, this is the key point of the book. Um, it also suggests inevitability. We're going to be creating 44 times as much digital, digital information in the year 2020 as we were in 2009. That's uh, from IDC. They're a different consultancy group. Now, we can all decide that we hate our phones. We can all decide that we hate living in a digital world. We can all decide that it sucks and get up and take our phones and throw them into the street and go and live off the grid and eat only like, you know, um, bamboo and tofu, whatever. <laughs> Problem is this, that's not going to affect an exponent that is that, 44 times. If everybody just dropped off the grid and subjected themselves to a mountain of inconvenience for a short period of time, you don't get 44% down to 0%. This is too large a number. We are going to grow the amount of information that we create by too much. So it is just inevitable. All of our conversation about data is only going to be about more data in the future, however we feel about it. You can't talk about this stuff without also talking about privacy. And uh, um, I mean, these days, the Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, um, pretty much every publication has been covering the question of big data, privacy, the NSA target um, uh, wonderfully and in great volume. Um, to me, our current debate about privacy represents an unfortunate and temporary state, and that's the one that I just described to you earlier. We all carry around a device that's constantly talking about us in a language we can't hear to parties we can't see. Now, the shift that's going to happen is we're going to be able to make use of that conversation more, if not actually understand it. And this is what I wanted to do with this book. I wanted to go out and I wanted to find people that were actually listening to the conversations that their machines were having about them, that they couldn't hear any other way. Um, all right. So this gives you a sense of what this conversation looks like in, uh, in the year 2020. Right around here, the human population was surpassed by the online population, all right, right around 2008 or so. When you get up to the year 2020, there are 50 billion machine-to-machine -machine collected devices. And that's where we get this number of 44 times as much information. So what will we as consumers, as regular citizens of Earth, be using that information for? This is what I wanted to find out. Um, because in actuality, we're going to use the data that we create for some pretty remarkable things. Um, case in point, who here knows where they are going to be a year and a half from right now within like a two block by two block radius. Who here believes that they know that with 80% certainty or higher? Always one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into how you say that, uh, know that later. Mo most people, if you know where you live and you know where you work, you've got two data points and you can make an inference, but that's two data points. It's not enough to make a real, a real uh, prognostication. So there's a researcher, researcher named Adam Sedalek, works at Microsoft uh, with a guy named John Kroom. I guess actually Sedalek has now shifted over to Google. And he wanted to know if he could figure this out. So he and Kroom got together a really remarkable data set. They got together um, 3,000 200 days of GPS data. They went out and they found a bunch of people and they put uh, GPS receivers on them and then they just watched them walk around and they watched them walk around for like six years. It's just a crazy amount of data. And what they found was that with a data set that size, they could actually figure out where someone was going to be in like up to 80 weeks into the future, like a year and a half into the future with higher than 80% accuracy. All of these things that we think of as random aren't actually as random as we think that they are. Little clues about where we're going to be are available in the information 
uh, uh, that we've already given to our phone. They're available in the conversations that our phones have been having with cell towers, um, with other machines, perhaps with RFID readers, uh, all the time. So now the next question is, if you know where you are going to be um, into the future up to 80 weeks in advance, do you feel better about that than if someone else knew, right? Now, if you talk about someone else knowing where you are going to be that far into the future, it's a gross, disgusting dystopia that no one wants to live in and everybody hates. If you talk about your own ability to do it for yourself, the difference is it's a superpower. <laughs> Right? That's a subtle shift that, that, that's enormous. What would you do with that superpower? Well, if you're talking about knowing where someone else is going to be and you're some sort of crazy, uh, you know, cynical supervillain, then you'll ambush them or something terrible like that. If you're talking about what the vast majority of human beings would do with that information about themselves, you would use it for exactly the opposite purpose. You would use it to avoid people you didn't want to see. Right? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, here's an example of that, that I see happening in the future. Kroom, um, Sedelic again, working with two Johns Hopkins researchers, uh, figured out from a data set of about 600,000 geotag tweets. Uh, he, he, he looked at this data set of people that were tweeting all of the time, and he figured out how to deduce 18% of the person-to-person -person flu transmissions that occurred among the population he was surveilling. So he figured out who was going to give someone else a cold. Now 18% is actually really remarkable when you consider that he, they can't model for surface transmission of influenza because that's not what um, you know, is, is possible right now. And the enormous number of variables that go into figuring out who's going to give you a cold. It's actually something that you can no, with a certain amount of, uh, of, of certainty. Um, back in the 70s, a bunch of researchers at Johns Hopkins figured out how long you had to be sitting next to someone on a plane before they would, that person would get you sick. So basically what they did, now it's possible through geotag tweets, through other social media, through the conversations that our phones are having about us all the time, it's possible to take that uh, simple formula and apply it to the entire world. The entire world becomes surveillable in that way. The entire world becomes an airplane that you can figure out who's going to give the other person a cold, right? So one output of that I see happening in the future, and already there's um, a couple of startups that are, are looking into creating this, is a, it's a push notification that tells you the probability of getting someone's cold. And then you make a decision about whether or not you want to see that person or not on the basis of how likely you are to catch their cold and how great their company is, which is the other aspect of that. Um, so I think this is, without doubt, a positive, a net positive for society. But it's also one that we haven't actually figured out how to deal with yet from a policy perspective. What if you're like um, uh, a school principal, is one of the uh, examples I bring up in a book. Um, and you know that one kid has a 20% chance of affecting, infecting another kid sitting next to him with the flu. 20% is not huge. If you are the mother of the kid that's going to get sick, 20% is enormous, right? So you're going to call and you're going to say, hey, listen, it looks like you've got my kid set next to this kid that has this you know, horrible bubonic-like thing, and we have a trip to Disney World planned next week, and I don't like that. 20% is too high for me. What do you do as an administrator? So this is a good thing. Everybody acknowledges this is a good thing. It's just one we're not ready for yet. It's one we haven't created policy around yet. But um, the data that we've created makes this a possibility right now. That's the naked future. Um, what else would you use this data for in terms of a superpower? So. A lot of you are probably thinking, you know what, that sounds great. I don't geotag my tweets. I, I particularly don't geotag my tweets when I feel sick. <laughs> <laughs> and statistically, you don't. People are much less likely to geotag their tweets when they're sick. It's unfortunate. They should geotag their tweets when they're sick more. But you know, I, me and epidemiologists all agree on this, and no one else believes this. All right. You're probably thinking that's just giving away way too much information. Because if I do that, I know how all this stuff works. 
what's going to happen is I'm going to be passing by like a CVS and I'm going to get a push notification on my phone that tells me, hey, looks like your flu probs are up <laughs> and you should, you know, jump on in and pick up some emergency and uh, something else to boost your immune system and uh, also pick up Theraflu because emergency doesn't work. Um, <laughs> And you're just going to be swamped with context-aware advertising all of the time. And uh, the bad news is that's, that is totally going to happen. We're all going to be experiencing a lot more context-aware advertising, if not in the form of a uh, push notification that goes up directly on the phone because no one wants that app. And certainly through, so, through Facebook, when we use their mobile app more, through Twitter, through all of them. Now, what if you had an app that told you this? that gave you a probability distribution for not liking the purchase you were about to make. What if this is also information that you give away in your phone all of the time. There's a startup called TickTrack um, and a couple others as well. And what they do is they take all of your live streams, all of the data that you create, not just with your comings and goings, if you want to give them to that, like your, your, your Fitbit data, your GPS data that you can collect in some form and stream out, but also your Amazon reviews if you want, your Yelp reviews, um, uh, your email if you would like, your calendar stuff. And they see how all of these different streams that are you relate to one another so you can create uh, insights based on these correlational patterns that were previously impossible. So you can see, for instance, how your interactions with one particular person affects your drinking, or how um, saving all of your emailing till the end of the day affects your schedule. It makes it, you know, so you don't have, you, uh, also the amount of time that you spend on email and the amount of uh, your stress level. How your exercise levels affect how much you pay for heating. I mean, we don't know. There's all of these different relationships that are suddenly visible if only we could understand a bit more of some of the signals that we send out through these computers that we carry around with us all of the time. Um, so this is uh, what we're moving towards, is the ability to know beforehand how we're going to react to a decision we're contemplating now in the present. Um, this is the sort of modeling that we're trying to give to uh, generals and huge decision makers. This is something that floats down to the individual consumer level at some point once we figure out how to take all of this information and make it consumer relevant. Um, here's another one. The information that you create right now that you give away in your phone can help you to be a better husband or a better uh, lover. Um, or just a nicer person. <clears throat> so I, uh, I am married, and my wife is an extremely intelligent person. She's getting a PhD from an Ivy League institution. So she speaks languages that uh, have, I didn't even know existed a little while ago. Um, apparently, there's a form of Japanese that's like just spoken between the emperor and his wife or something. And you know, she knows all this stuff. So despite this, uh, despite being married to this extremely interesting person, I am not always a fantastic conversationalist. In fact, we have a sort of long distance marriage now, so I'm uh, just not always able to pay a lot of attention uh, in phone conversation, which shouldn't be shocking to anyone because I am a man. <laughs> <laughs> and we cannot pay attention to when we are not paying attention because we are not paying attention. <laughs> so knowing this, there's a researcher at MIT, his name is Sandy Pentland. Um, who here knows Sandy Pentland? Has heard the name. Every, he also has a book, and since you've already bought mine, I can recommend his to you without reservation. It's very, very good. Um, and he's one of the uh, big data muckety mucks at the MIT Media Lab. That's uh, been his thing for forever. And uh, he wanted to figure out if he could use mobile-created uh, data to understand human relationships in a new way. So he calls this honest signaling. There are honest signals. And this is all of the information that we uh, are, is not connected to our literal conversations. So how you relate to someone says as much about how you're going to interact with them and the outcome of that interaction as anything you're like literally saying. So for instance, um, 
if I stand here and I take a kind of Abe Lincoln posture and I speak to you like this, keeping my shoulders square, I'm telling you that I'm taking a particular role in this exchange, and it is like the leadership role, and you will sit and you will listen until I decide to stop talking. And for, at the same time, if I talk to you like the way I talk to everybody, which is the way I'm talking right now, using my hands and with my voice going up and down a whole lot, then I'm telling you that I don't actually like talking to people the way that other guy talks to people. I'm more interested in hearing from you, which I actually really am, and I'm interested in exploring different ideas with you, and let's go to these places together. That sounds totally fun. And at the same time, if I just stand and I listen to you, if I just listen to you and actually give you my full attention, I'm also signaling to you a role I'm going to take in our encounter. And then you're going to respond without realizing it by adopting the role that's most complementary to that exchange. Right? So uh, these are the subtleties of, of human interaction that escape digital record keeping until Sandy Pentland decided to outfit a bunch of people with a device looks like this. It's, he called it a sociometer. So uh, it records gesture and it records voice. And uh, he outfitted a whole bunch of people with these. And what he found was that after he had a large enough data set with just 30 seconds of this sociometer data, Sandy Pentland could predict how a whole bunch of different interactions were going to play out. So if it was a business negotiation and you had two people talking about um, who was going to get, uh, you know, win like the salary, a higher salary or a lower salary, then he could predict which side was going to come out uh, ahead. If it was like a speed date, he could figure out if the number was going to get exchanged or if the two parties were going to stand up and go their separate ways. So his partner in this endeavor is a researcher named Anmol Madan, who now runs Ginger.io. Um, and he actually created, prior to this, an app. Um, it ran on a, on a system called the Zaris phone, which uh, not a lot of people have now. But it was extremely prophetic. It was extremely future focused. And uh, it would basically do this. It would tell you. <laughs> how you could improve your, your interactions with the person you were talking to. He called it the jerkometer. <laughs> I would find this extremely useful. Um, so th these are just like a few examples of all of the different ways, all of the data that we create. Um, once we figure out how to start having a more constructive conversation about privacy, uh, has the potential to actually change our lives for the better. Um, and make us better in a lot of different ways. So um, here's another one, crime. Um, <clears throat> so you guys do a lot of modeling here. You guys do a lot of uh, like data modeling here, right? <clears throat> this is uh, where the book gets a little bit theoretical, but it's not completely uh, nuts. <clears throat> you can model the likelihood of being a victim of a crime on the basis of actually not a ton of, of variables. So. This is what's called the victimology continuum. This is something that police investigators use in order to, um, in, the, in the first few 48 hours after a, after a murder, say, to figure out you know, uh, the potential suspects. It's something that you see played out in all of these crime shows, like uh, you know, um, you know, CSI and, and uh, oh, what's the other one? The one with like Dick Wolf, where it's like, dun, dun, law and order. All right. <laughs> So there are three factors that kind of go into the likelihood of being or perpetrating a crime. Circumstance, situation, and environment. So circumstance is basically who you are. Are you a homemaker? Are you a drug dealer? Homemaking drug dealer. Are you <coughs> situation? What you're doing? Are you at church? Dealing drugs? Dealing drugs at church? Are, and, and where? Where are you located? So. Uh, on the basis of how these th three things are, are interacting, you can chart the probability of suffering, someone suffering from uh, a, a dangerous crime. So here on, on this chart, they have uh, prostitute, drug dealer, high risk. Risk goes up depending on you know, if you're a prostitute or a drug dealer that is um, in a dangerous neighborhood conducting regular business versus homemaker, politician with high security, low risk over here. 
Um, and you can see you know, all the different ways you could combine these to come up with different outcomes. But <coughs> what's possible now with the fact that everybody is carrying around a computer that's constantly logging where they are and where they're going, um, circumstance you know in your head, like you just know it. But situation and environment can be scored, right? They can be scored along with circumstance to output to any individual in the future, theoretically, a score telling them the likelihood of them suffering from a crime and how that's changing depending on what they're doing and where they're going. This is not beyond the realm of possibility to do now. It's just a matter of collecting the right data and representing it in this way. Um, the likelihood of war breaking out. So what is this NEMO award that you guys did? You figured out on the basis of um, a couple of variables how food scarcity is, uh, potentially affects uh, geopolitical events. Is that what I heard right? Yeah, we're, we're, we're currently working on take five minutes to take the vote. Yeah. yeah, I would like, to, like I was listening to that and I totally pulled out my laptop and was like, oh my god, I totally want to follow up on that because that's something else that's possible to understand now on a much more uh, practical way as a result of all of the data that we're creating. Um, so this is the, I, I, I don't even have to tell you this, this is a sort of old, this is the food price index and you can see how the food, uh, rapid food price inflation, I think it's like 60% in a year, um, gives rise to geopolitical events. In 2008 you have this rapid food price inflation event and it's punctuated by events in Yemen, in India, uh, in Sudan, in, this is a key one, Tunisia, in Somalia, and here you have what? Tunisia, then Libya, then Egypt. That's the Arab Spring. Predictable on the basis, theoretically, of rapid in, uh, inflation in the food price index. So, <coughs> Every, uh, not a lot of people know this, but um, in many parts of the developing world, people don't subscribe to regular cell phone contracts that they pay on a monthly basis. They show up at places and they kind of uh, buy more credits for their phone depending on when they have money. Uh, so on the event of people don't buy credits for their phone when there isn't enough money for food. So this is one of the first in-line indicators of potential food price inflation as people not re-upping their cell phone contracts in a lot of different places. Um, okay, so this is going to change, I think, the way we live, too. I mean, the way we interact with the, uh, with the physical environment around us. We can't forget that. Um, I'm a... Earlier, I, I got called a futurist. I love this, uh, this idea of being a futurist. I don't think you should give money to anyone who calls themselves a futurist. <laughs> uh, my job was to you know, talk to people who had really interesting ideas about the future, and a lot of them were designers. And uh, uh, one of the big important designs of the last few years has been this idea of like self-driving cars. It's actually been more than uh, 10 years since the DARPA Grand Challenge, uh, which showed uh, the potential of self-driving cars, but it was really the second one, the one in 2006, that, uh, where the, the car actually succeeded. So we've had a proof of concept for self-driving cars for 10 years, and we still haven't prepared for self-driving cars on any sort of uh, large level because we haven't figured out the data yet. We haven't figured out yet that all of these cars are going to need a lot of data and they're going to be creating a lot of data, they're going to be creating a lot of data about us. Uh, because they're going to be picking us up and dropping us off at different places, and as soon as we wrap our heads around that, then we can understand an entirely different urban universe. Um, so, the year 2025, the United States will need basically way too much concrete, way too much metal, way too much water, way too much oil if things continue uh, and, uh, at the track that uh, they have been proceeding. Here's a different idea. And again, it is, it is actually linked to data and the data that we create. This is the Smart Cities program from MIT. It's a bunch of stackable cars like this. Um, there's a motor in each wheel, so it could do like 360 turns. But it's paired with a motorbike and a bicycle. So it works like this. It's sort of like the Zipcar model. You pay a subscribership, you get access to the car, you get access to the bike, you get access to the motorbike. You don't own any one of them, but they're all over the place. Um, so one of the barriers to this 
really getting off the ground was, you know, they modeled it and um, people would, like, for instance, take the bikes from their homes in the suburbs into the cities and then uh, pick up their groceries and take their groceries home in the cars, right? But then all the cars wind up in the suburbs and all the bikes are in the cities, which is not where you need them. Okay. No, 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 that was the timer, it wasn't the phone. I can't believe no one's phone's gone off yet. <laughs> okay. Self-driving cars does is this. The car can then drive itself back out of the suburbs into the city center. And all of a sudden, the result, according to, um, I think it was Xerox, and a couple of other people that looked at this, you need 10 times fewer cars. You just need far fewer cars when you're dealing with a shared self-driving car ecosystem. And these cars, like I said, they're going to be, like I would take mine to work and then it would go pick up someone else and perhaps I would get revenue off that if I owned the car or not, uh, if I was just paying into a, a subscription plan. Um, and they're always moving and they can park really far away from where you are, you know? So they can drop you off at your house, you can live downtown, and you don't have to worry about parking. The car parks itself somewhere really far away. So this does away with parking lots, it does away with on-street parking. All of the world that we live in begins to look very differently. And these cars, this is the naked future where the world literally anticipates your every move. In order to optimize this entire system, these cars would know where you needed to go almost before you did. They would be interfacing with your calendar. They would be interfacing with all of this data that you're creating. And they would be um, meeting your needs in many ways before you were able to express them. And that's the future, I ideally. That's a possible future uh, that would arrive from the result of a variety of different technologies, the proof of concept of which has passed 10 years ago. So, Here's sort of what they look like, too. You pull up to the curb here, and they kind of dump you forward. <laughs> I thought they were really cool. I love, I love this idea. Um, oh, and they were also, because it was the uh, subscriber model, you can park them, and then the excess uh, electricity in the battery ties back into the grid. Yeah, yeah. isn't that cool? Yeah. OK. So <laughs> bottom line, and then we're going to take some questions. We have reached a point in human history where we create information in everything that we do. But we're threatened by that right now instead of understanding it as the amazing opportunity that it is. And so all I would like to suggest is that it's time we all begin really listening. And then uh, the landscape of human experience will expand beyond anything we can fathom today. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. How long until we need to be getting rid of all of these parking spaces? What, what sort of time frame are you talking about here? Well, it depends. Now, here's the thing. <laughs> if, because a lot of different car companies are looking at this, right? Um, so if you talk to uh, Nissan, they say they want to have a self-driving car prototype by 2020. Uh, if you talk to Tesla, they're like, we want to beat them and we want to have something available next year. If you talk to Ford, they'll say, we don't think this is ever going to catch on. Now, I talked to the futurist at Ford. <laughs> and uh, she's like, you know, we're going to begin to build a lot more sort of uh, AI components into the cars on a limited basis. Because nobody wants to show up in front of their shareholders and say, the global market for our product is going to decrease by an exponent. Of no one does that. No one wants that job. That's a bad day. <laughs> and yet, no one wants to be the second person to show up and say, that new market that will then exist, we're going to capture that. That's going to be entirely ours. You've got to be the first person to say that. So it's a game of chicken um, that's still in the works. But like I said, see, I, this is why I, I don't think you should give money to a futurist. I see that the technology has been proof of concept 10 years. And we're talking about now just combining a bunch of data streams. So there's no technical reason why we couldn't have this in 2020 at all. Um, it just depends on whether or not we elect people with foresight and government. I think that you'll probably see versions of this sooner in places like China, possibly North, uh, South Korea, and Japan. 
before the United States. I think that's where you're really going to see the proof of concept. And I do think you will see that within five years. Because um, it's particularly China, you've got top-down leadership. You also have um, a tremendous uh, expanse of building operations. Um, and you have just sort of raw enthusiasm for this stuff. You don't have the same uh, legislative or even infrastructural legacy issues that we have in the United States. OK, next. <laughs> oh, like like that radar finder for your phone? Waze, yeah. There's Waze, but because um, people people there used to be, yeah. Before Waze, like people just had a thing uh, that detected radar on their on their dash. You remember those? That thing actually had to detect radar. All Waze has to do is detect people that can you know plug in. I think that I kind of like the radar ones more. All right. So here's the thing, though. If you can figure out your uh, and victimology continuum, then you can figure out the likelihood of a cop sort of coming to where uh, you are or to his particular place. The police across the country are building out what they're calling predictive policing. Who here is familiar with predictive policing? Right. So it's basically the application of big data and statistics to the pre-deployment of police assets to very particular case places. And that's migrating from like the uh, headquarters level to the mobile unit level. And from there, I think you could see, I don't know. Uh, why could you not see that app within five years? I'll say five years. Well, IBM has it in their, in their advertisement. Done. <laughs> OK, we're, we'll, we'll pick up some more questions as you sign books. Oh, OK, okay all, right. all right. Cool. Hey, thanks so, so much, guys. Really appreciate it.